My guest today is Mark Lewis. Mark is an entrepreneur. He's a facilitator. He's an author. He's a co-founder. He's a coach and so much more. Mark, I'm so glad we're making this happen. We've been going back and forth a little bit. We're here. Mark, welcome. Just to, for everybody listening, it is nice and early here on the East Coast for both of us, 9 a.m. on Friday, November 17th. Mark, where are you joining us from today? Actually, I'm southwest of Atlanta. My in-laws have a house here. We're visiting not only for the holidays, but also do some care, doing some caretaking for them. Always fun. <laughs> oh, the <laughs> things we do. Well, Mark, yeah. I know we have a lot to talk about today, so let's get right in it and get to know you, all the great things you're doing in the business world, some other additional things I just learned about you you're doing with your wife that I think is really interesting, and we'll go from there. So, Mark, let's get right into it. Let's talk first about what's something that you really nerd out about we want to hear about something that isn't business or leadership or things that are related to your business. What's something you nerd out about? So this is a funny one that the first thing that comes to mind is uh, centered around dogs. I have a, a golden retriever dog. It's kind of small. And you may think this is this is probably really nerdy. But one of the things that really entertains me is when I throw a ball on a hardwood floor, he goes running after it and he just skids like he skids on, a, on ice. And it's just so humorous for him. And he finally gets it and he runs past it. It just It's just really comical. And then it just really makes me laugh every single time. Sometimes he knows he has to stop quickly. But I, I nerd about that. It's just an entertaining thing. It's so fun. It's, a ball for a ball. It's, it's really funny. And he, he loves it. Well, Mark, this is so funny. And you, we, we're just getting to know each other. We are also a Golden Retriever family. And our golden retriever is hilarious. And people who know me will know I definitely, her name is Sunshine. I definitely nerd out about her. And a lot of times I'll tell people she's my favorite kid. She, uh, you know, I've, I've had golden retrievers probably over the last 15 years. I, I, I had two of them. One passed away about a year ago and the other one is just a terrific. They're just, they just have a terrific kindness about them. They're loving, you know, sometimes I tell, my, my twin sister came up with this state, statement, let me be the person that my dog thinks I am. Because they're always yeah. happy to be around you. They love you when you come through the door. You can never do anything wrong. It's just yeah. a great, it's just very satisfying. Yeah, Mark, Mark, you and I are going to have to come do a whole separate episode. We're just going to talk about golden retrievers for an hour. Now, I, I always, I always, the thing I'll, I'll leave with on this is I always say, if I'm going to come back in another life, if you believe in that, I want to come back as my golden retriever. Like she's got the best life. So, you know, it's funny because I was going to ask you, other than a human being reincarnated as what? And you would come back as a golden retriever. I would Probably answer yeah. that. That answer would be I'd come back as a dolphin because dolphins always have a smile on their face. Yeah. They're sharks don't like them. They're very warm. They're helpful. That would be my reincarnation other than a human being. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer this real quick since we're improv on this. It would not be a dog. I would want to come back as an eagle, like a bald eagle, ah. because king, kind of the king of the skies yep. in the United States, completely protected. And you just get to chill out. And anytime you're hungry, you just look down at the water and go, hey, where's some trout? And you just go down and feed yourself. <laughs> and I love flying. I would love to be able to fly it and get around fast. I think that would be amazing. Yes. Yeah. So, so, Mark, let's talk about comfort zones now. I know this is something you you do a lot of coaching of executives. This is something that I'm sure you're discussing with your clients and the places you facilitate a lot. What's first of all, what's something that is really inside of your comfort zone that you know is just outside of other people's comfort zones? Well, frankly, my dad taught me this at a very early age and he told me to take the bait. But I really enjoy getting in front of a couple hundred people and talking about something I'm very passionate about. You know, a lot of people get nervous and they get it's they're afraid of public speaking. I yeah. like doing it. The reason I like yeah. doing it is because I think I can make an impact on people and provide some ideas that can actually improve their lives. And that's kind of centered around my book that I wrote. But I love giving presentations because it can be because of the impact it can have on other people's lives. You know, Mark, that's such a good reframe of public speaking that I do a lot of that as well. And what I'll say to people that they have nervous about it. There's a, it's really easy. Get over yourself. It's yeah. about your audience and your content. And if you can truly do that and make that switch that I'm here to make an impact, I want these 200 people, or for those listening to this podcast, I want the people that are listening to this podcast. It's not about really about you and I, it's about what we're talking about, but it's about what it's about what we're talking about 
and them getting impact, that makes public speaking so much easier. You're like, it's not about me. I'm just the uh, vessel. I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and people, I think people get nervous because they have a feeling that people are going to judge them in a way. And that's not how, if you think about it, when you talk to people, they don't judge you. Or, you know, I've been on TV a lot and you think people are going to judge you. Or And I don't like watching myself on TV. I used to do a program yeah. called Diesel Gumbo in New Orleans to help people with technology. And I did that once a month and people would just get so afraid and nervous about it, but it's not about judging. It's about the impact you can have on people. And if you can keep that in your, in the front of your mind, public speaking is really easy. Yeah, exactly. And just not make it about you. And the thing I'll say about the judging is people are judging you, but they're generally judging you to help you to succeed. Like how many people go to a conference or a speech and be like, I really want Mark to bomb on this stage. I want this to be bad. No, people are like, hey, like I want this to be good. And then, and then, and so it's it's a really good reframe. So Mark, what's on the other side of that? Something that is outside of your comfort zone that you know is inside of other people's comfort zones. Well, you know, that's a that's an interesting question. And I, I would think that when I first thought of it, it's about, you know, a lot of people like to race cars, right? And and, yeah. and I'm not a guy that likes speed anyway. And I'm not comfortable with speed because speed kills, right? So I know there are a lot of people, and it's probably a niche market, but I, I'm not one that could ever go and do a car racing. In fact, I got, as part of uh, a membership that I belong to, Entrepreneurs Organization of Louisiana, we went on a trip and they wanted to do car racing and i said oh, just that's not into me it's not just what i like to do it's just fearful for me yeah have you ever been in a race car i have not yeah i have not either and i have a friend who's big into race. he just got big into racing and he's so addicted to it i said and then he he and he crashed a car last month on a, on an actual racetrack and i said why that's like yeah. my question I'm like why but he loves it yeah, I think it has to do with the thrill of the challenge. Like I could never do bungee jumping, right? I probably couldn't go out and get an airplane and do a skydive. You know, just something about that that I don't need that kind of thrill seeking. And a lot, a lot of people do thrill seeking type stuff. That's just not in my DNA. Yeah. Well, I would I would say that you do thrill seeking in a different way. You found startups like that. That's its own version of racing and <laughs> right. like. Lots of unknowns, lots of ups and downs. Uh, we were talking earlier before we started recording, you're doing some fundraising, like that's not for the faint of heart. So that's a whole different thing. You know, you're right about that. And sometimes you have to, when you're doing fun, fundraising and you have to keep an organization going, you got to put in your own money to make sure that the company sustains itself. And, you know, I always look at that. It says, well, you know, I have a once in a lifetime opportunity that I, maybe I can make a difference to create memories for people over time. I'm willing to make that investment. I've lost, but I've also won. So sure. the risk reward relationship based in, in what you're doing, you just have to be attuned to what kind of impact you might have on people. Look, in everything I do, I want to make sure that I have an impact on people. I, I really give a damn about people and how they're successful and how I can learn, how can I take what I've learned and, and let them have my knowledge to make them a better person and, and have better success. Mark, that's a great title for a book. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark, let's talk now about yeah. There, what a what a great what a great lead in. So, Mark, let's talk about uh, speak. You're talking about speaking. You said just said give a damn. Let's talk about what you would talk to us about if you had five minutes and the whole world got yeah. to hear Mark Lewis give his message to us. What would you want us to know? And what would be your call? And what would be your call to action? So, you know you. I didn't mean to lead you down that road, but you took the bait, I guess. <laughs> so take the, I, I learned think, how to take the bait. <laughs> so what I what I would really like to do is get this message. You know, over, I've been around a lot longer than you have, and I've learned over how society has become a very more about ego driven, self centered society. And so yeah. what I wrote, the reason I wrote the book, because I saw this transformation, and we need to go down this road to move from a self-centered to selfless society. Because over time, we there was a lot of things that factored into this, but over time we've gone down this road and, and I think it's caused a lot of violence. Uh, it's caused the technology has been an issue. We don't communicate like we used to. So I would get this message out. The message is, if you wanna live a longer life, if you wanna live a happier life, then what you need to do is what I do and I, and I as, 
I, I want to serve other people. And by serving other people, I serve myself. But a lot of people get it wrong. We need to always do the right thing. And a lot of people justify doing the wrong thing because they think in their mind it's right, even though it's wrong. So I would say in today's society, let's be more willing to help each other out, not just when a major occurrence happens where we do these kind of things becomes naturally for us. Let's keep, let's be kind, let's show respect and do, let's negotiate, let's collaborate, do all the right things. Because in effect, you're going to live longer, you're going to have less stress, and you're going to have a better life. And that's what everybody wants. That's, that would be my message. And yeah. the call to action is actually what I have here. This is a sheet that I've created. It's called the Global Accountability Pledge. Mm. You can go on my website and take this pledge that says, I'll be respectful, I'll be kind, I'll do all the right things. And if everybody joined this movement, this give it damn movement, and signed this Global Accountability Pledge, I think society would transform into a better one that we have today. I love it, Mark. We're going to put that in the show notes. I will go sign that. I believe in that. I have a saying that I heard that I really like, and it's, hey, what's the best way to show somebody that you care? Just actually care. Just actually care. You don't need to show anybody. Oh, I know. If you actually care, you don't have to show people. You know, that's part of caring. What can I do to help somebody's life? Like you go to a grocery store and I go to the grocery clerk and she doesn't look like she's having fun. And so... I go, you know, she goes, oh, how are you doing today? And I go, terrific. And she's like, whoa, what's with this guy? Yeah. What? And, 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 but, you know, what happens, it's a smile on her face, right? Yeah. You might think I'm crazy, but I'm in a good mood. I show positivity. And that transforms into a smile. So I've impacted her in some small way. The, that's what we want to do as a society. Impact somebody in a very small way. And then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And guess what? And everybody wins. You know, stress is the major disease in today's world. Stress causes yep. cancer. Stress causes everything, I think, physically. And if you can yep. reduce your stress, you're going to live longer. And you reduce your stuff by being kind, helping others, smiling, being positive, all those factors enter. It's a tough challenge for people. Love it. Mark, we're going to take a brief commercial break. We'll be right back after this. The Talking to Cool People podcast is brought to you by Jason Frizzell Coaching. Jason works with amazing people who are looking to find and develop their passion and purpose and create their journey to wherever it is they want to go. Check us out at jasonfrizzell.com, Facebook, or on Instagram. Jason loves hearing from anyone who thinks it would be cool to connect, to be coached, or to be a guest on our show. Email him at podcast at jasonfrizzell.com or DM him on Facebook and Instagram. And now, back to some more amazing conversation on talking to cool people. All right, Mark, we're back. So now, love to have you share with us anything else you think that the audience should know about you. So you're, we got to chat for a few minutes before we press record. I learned a lot of interesting things about you very quickly. What do you want us to? What do you want us to know about you? May it be your journey, what drives you, anything at all. Well, you know. Uh, Part of my success, I have to give credit to my dad. I started at a very early age as being an entrepreneur. I had a grass cutting business. I had a newspaper route. I played sports. I was pretty active. I really didn't have any chance to get in trouble, to be honest with you. And I think based on what's happened in today's society, there's less of that going on. So I've been blessed. And part of that, what I want to do is give back to what my dad provided to me over time. And and so I, I'm, I'm pretty driven. Um, I work hard. Uh, I want to help people out. Here I'm at, I don't think I'll ever retire. Um, mm. You know, I'm getting to that retirement age, but I don't feel like I, I can do that because I, God instilled me a lot of education and a lot of support from other people. And I've learned from that. And I just want to continue that support and love and caring and doing what I can to help other people. I love that. Yeah, my friend Bill Hogtrip, he has this saying, people ask him, hey, how would, he's been quite successful in his career, he's founded a couple of companies, and they say, how are you so successful? He said, he said, there was no option for me to be not successful. The only thing in the way of me would have been me because, again, good parents, good ethics, good values, 
raised with a work ethic to care about people. Real, and he's a really wonderful person. But he, but people say, hey, how did you do this? He goes, he goes. The only thing that could have ever stopped me would just have been my own stuff. And I kind of feel that way about myself too. It sounds like you were raised that way. I am fully aware that there are people that are not fortunate to be to have to have like a childhood like that that sets you up for success. And it's not to me. It's not so much about money. It's about values and kindness sure. and who you want to be in the world. Yep. Mark, what would you like to ask me about? Well, I asked you that one question about being reincarnation, but you know, I have a special interview technique that I use that is designed to help people find the right person to fit into their organization. I have the saying, hire for culture, train for skill. So I have totally. these 90 bots that I use to find and understand how a person thinks, how they are motivated, how they react, how they are stressful. And so I have a bunch of these questions. So oh, I if love I were it. to ask you one of those questions. You can I ask me multiple. Say, this is fun. <laughs> I'd have I to get it. the book out. But the, something comes to mind. I would say, okay, what five name five words that best describe you. Five single words that best describe you. Mm -hmm. Passion, energy, drive, connection, and play. So somebody's asked you this before. <laughs> this the no. <laughs> no. Some No. Somebody has not asked me this before. It's a cheat code because part of my coach training and when I've worked with coaches, my very first coach, we did an exercise where you go out and you externally get this information in a very specific way. So you don't, so I didn't come up with those myself and I'll, I'll give this exercise. It's really good. You go out, you go out and ask 10 people or 20 people or 30 people or 10 people or five people. It doesn't matter. What shows up when I walk into a room? And so what you're really vetting out there is not, hey, Mark, what are the things that you love about my skill as an engineer or my skill as a coach? It's like, what actually shows up? Like you said, you seem like a very, po I bet you people say, Mark, you're really positive a lot. Like the, hey, I'm terrific today. That's why it's a cheat code for me because I actually have those, we call them our essence words. It's who you are in the world. If you're religious, you might say, this is how you were created by a higher power. If you're not religious, you may just say, this is how I was, how I was born which is why for me, that is an easy question. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, well, my wife and my, and I have a mug. My wife made me a mug with those words. So I'm like, Oh, this is an easy one. So now Mark, I'm going to, I'm going to have you give me something a little more. I'm going to have you give me something different. Cause that one's easy. Okay. I'll give you another one. If yeah. you won a hundred million dollars in lottery, what would you do with it? Mm, mm. What would I do with the money or what would I do with my life? Or both. What would you do if a hundred million dollars in the lottery? You have what, yeah, what's open. the first thing that comes to your mind when I ask that question? Yeah, the first the first thing I do is I would pay off all of our debts. I would max out the kids five twenty nines that so they could go wherever they wanted to school, like that, take care of them that way. I would take a look at our family and figure out if anybody need anything to like make sure they're completely set up, not to give them enough to do nothing, but just enough to like, hey, like is there any student loans or things? I, that would be the first place I would go. And then I would, <laughs> I would call our financial planner and say, Hey, Mark, I've got some really good news. <laughs> what should we be doing next? Uh, and then for me on a personal note, I think this, and I'm going to speak about this. For, I think my wife would be aligned. We would probably set up a portion of that income to go invest in startups. My wife works in tech. I coach a lot of tech people. I love that world. So have a portion of that. In other words, have a portion of that hundred million. And I'm going to assume a hundred million after taxes. Uh, okay. <laughs> cause I, cause I like to go high. I would, I would likely earmark a certain portion of it and go, we might lose this, but I want to go. Right. And maybe it's some, maybe it's some charitable, charitable, maybe some nonprofit investment. Maybe it's some for-profit investment because we, my wife and I both love that space. So that's what I would do. We would not buy anything. We would not buy a yeah. new house. We would not do that. And well, the other thing we would, we would take a killer vacation. Because yeah. we are vacation people. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. I guess I would answer that question is if I had a hundred million dollars, I'd probably give out ninety of it away because I can live very comfortably on interest on ten million. All right. Oh God, yeah. yeah. It for people who who wouldn't, you know, I pay off the debts too, so I'd be comfortable that way. But I would give most of all of it away. And then yeah. you, you've done the same thing. You give it to your kids. I would give it to charity. So we're, we're kind of aligned the same way. Cause look, yeah. these people that make, you know, they get these $500 million contracts over 10 years. It's just absurd to me. You know, you know, and not everybody's like that. And they don't need that kind of money to live. It just, yeah. I don't know. It just, 
it's just amazing to me how that that works. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, one thing I would say about this, my wife would be aligned with that is this is, and I'm sure you've read the statistics about the amount of people that are actually bankrupted in three years of winning the lottery. Yeah. We would, I would not go and buy an expensive home or a, like, you know, like mm -hmm. a, like a mil something that like people are like, Oh, I bought this like yacht. And then the yacht costs you like 30 grand a month. I'm like, well, that's going to go quickly. I wouldn't do any of those things. I would definitely, I would, the other thing I'm going to say, I'd buy myself some new guitars because I'm a guitar player. I'd, I'd spend a little money on things that truly give me joy, but I would not, I would not yeah. like, Oh, I'm going to go buy a private plane. No, no, because then there's an operating expense with it. And that's when you go bankrupt. That's cool. I love that question. And so before we move on here, is that something that you ask people in an interview process? Yes, I do. So I have like these 90 prompts, like I said, and it's like favorite car or favorite movie, favorite historical character. You know, they got to pick between revenue and customer service, custom service and quality. Yeah. And, all that kind of stuff. and it just kind of goes down because then I find out whether or not they're going to fit into my culture or the culture of an organization, because that's more important than anything because you can train people a skill. They're going to have a skill coming into the job anyway, yeah. but you can train them. You yeah. can't train an attitude generally, and but you got to have somebody that can fit into your culture. And because as they fit into the culture, everybody works together. It becomes team. It's a family. They all want to help each other out. The attitude's all the same. The same, and that's how a company flourishes. So I, yeah. I, it's a it's a it's a, actually a book I sell. It's a process, almost like a software program that I oh, sell cool. to organizations, and it's worked remarkably well. I mean, it's yeah. it's so powerful. People when they use it, because I give it to my CEOs and my CEO roundtables as part of their pro part of the program that we provide to them, and they're amazed how well it works. Never people don't think that way. Yeah, generally. So Mark, so Mark, what are some answers to that question that would be a red flag for you? Well, so someone answers favorite color and they go red or blue. Those two are two opposite colors. You know, red's kind of a hard color, blue's a soft color. If someone says favorite movie and they say the Ten Commandments or Aladdin, and they're adult, that says something about them. It says someone says a favorite historical character might be someone's this hasn't happened before, but someone might say Charles Manson and someone might say oh boy. You know, it, it it defines the way they think. And those definitions, someone chooses like customer service versus revenue and they say revenue, that's a defining moment because customer service is more important. Revenue, revenue is generated by good customer service. Quality yeah. or revenue, if they present, they say revenue, quality is more important than revenue. If they go customer service and quality, they say, well, you can't really separate the two. There's, they're both important. All these things and how they answer develop as a pattern of how they think. And sometimes they get flustered. And so sure. when they get flustered on, a, on a, an answer, they make it fidgety or they make a, I don't really know. They get irritated. This character flow, this nonverbal communication comes up. And within 10 minutes, you're going to know whether you want to hire that person. Look, there was yeah. a lady came in and said, I want to hire this person. She's terrific. We interviewed her once. And before you do that, go through this exercise. They went through that exercise with, like four of their management people answer these questions. You know what happened? No way. They couldn't, she couldn't, yeah. she wasn't going to be able to fit, even though she had all the criteria. She interviewed really well, but when they answered those questions, it was a big red flag. And that's what you yeah. want. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen this. I've seen this in tech companies. There's actually questions or at least one question in the process. They want you to say, I don't know. Right. To admit that you don't know. And, that's actually a huge red flag. And we're talking about these complicated, like no way you would possibly know this thing unless you were sitting in front of a computer or were the expert. And when you see people try to make up an answer as opposed to like, Hey, I actually don't know. That's a, that's a powerful positive Correct. as a leader. Correct. I think. Yeah. They're being very truthful because a lot of people yeah. get these interview questions and they trying to, they're trying to determine what they want you to hear, what they want to hear, what you think they want to hear. And so yeah. they'll answer you can't fool this and there's no way you can't really lie yeah. so yeah. like you know you reincarnated what would be another one you know someone says yeah. a tree someone says an eagle gold retriever dolphin or lion it all congregates into saying something about that person it's yeah and it's it's so powerful it really is do you before we move on here i'm curious about this process do you let people know 
coming in that there's going to be some questions like this or is this do yeah. you put them on the spot oh nice no, I, I love look, it the way i do it i go i said look i'm just gonna this interview is gonna be a little bit different i'm just gonna say one or two words i want you to tell me the first thing that comes to your mind there's no right or wrong answers i just want to know a little bit more about you you know and so i answer that it's like favorite sports team or favorite whatever i mean i got on five categories personal business there's random, there's education and hobbies or something along those lines, yeah. like favorite subject in school, you know, all that stuff. It, it all congregates yeah. together. It's really, actually, it's fun to do. Oh, sure. That would be really, maybe not so fun for certain personality types. No, what, but exactly. I, I do have one more question. <laughs> What's the strangest answer you've ever gotten any of these questions where you're just like, I can't believe they just said that. You, you have um, to have some memorable ones. Well, I provide this, I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a self-employed, so I don't do a lot of hiring, but I do, you know, I think the strangest one I had was, you know, reincarnated as what is a tree. And I, you know, that seemed kind of odd to me. And I asked why, and then, and they said, well, we produce fruit, we produce shade, all these things, which made kind of sense. So I didn't really have any unusual mm -hmm. answers that come to mind based on an EV technique, to be honest with you. Nothing no, that's really good. out there. That's good. That is interesting. A tree, because a tree isn't really, you really don't know you're a tree if you're no. a tree. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You don't like, you're exactly right. It's a little different, a little odd. <clears throat> yeah. But if they, if they do a lot of ad, odd questions, I answer odd answers like that, it's just like, yeah, these guys are a little out there. And, you know, maybe it won't fit into the culture. But... Or maybe that's just what you need in the culture. Maybe you need somebody True, who's a little less. Yeah. You're right. You're absolutely right. Because every situation, depending on the job that you're interviewing for, going to have required different answers like so, someone says on a scale of one to ten how organized you are you and if they're accountant and then they say two i'm going well yeah. i don't think so yeah. you know yeah yeah no. okay. nice mark well let's talk now about passionate you seem like a very passionate person so what is it that you are passionate about well you know i moderate ceo roundtables and i try to i don't try because try implies failure i help CEOs find strategies, initiatives that can help accelerate the growth of their business. And so I do this. It's a round table of 15 to 18 people. We get together once a month, 10 months out of the year. We talk about specific things like goal setting, best practices in human resources, lean organization, financial resources, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm passionate about helping organizations, smaller companies, anywhere from a million to 50 million to help them get better organized, set goals, do all the kind of things that I know help organizations achieve success. And so yeah. when I do that, I'm, I feel passionate about that because when I provide that to them, I can see the change over a course of the year and how passionate they are in implementing these things and the success that they have. So I'm pretty passionate about helping CEOs accelerate growth their business by providing even one or two, three or four initiatives that can make a huge difference in their company. Yeah. What do you, I, I love this topic. I do a lot of this work as well. What's, what's something, what's like, if you had to categorize the biggest challenge that most CEOs have that you've worked with or currently work with, what is the thing that's on your people's minds? or that will have them move to the next level or whatever that means to them? You know, the biggest challenge I have with CEOs is they don't know how to set goals. And I was mm. shocked at this. That, you know, they go, okay, well- That is I'm, interesting. I'm, it, it's, it's a goal setting because they're never specific. So I want to take a vacation. I'm going, okay, well, that's a wish, you know? It's like, <laughs> well, when do you want to take the vacation? How long do you want it to be? And who are you going to go with? And yeah. so they don't- Set these, you know, these goals, and they're very bad at it. And I'm surprised. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, you got to be specific. Yeah, they've got to be smart. You know, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. And they don't do it. And that's the thing that uh, that shocks me. And I have to, you know, we break off into groups and we have to reset these goals, and then they finally get it. But their goal setting and their budgeting process of being able to measure and set KPIs, key performance indicators against these goals so they can make adjustments along the way they just go and they don't set mm -hmm. goals so i make how, them do it yeah so how how do they get to the point where they're the ceo of a million to a 50 million dollar business regard in spite of that how do they get 
Well, sometimes people succeed, succeed despite themselves, to be honest with you. But yeah. there's going to be a point in time where you don't do the right things because in every life, in every business, you're going to have your ups and downs. And how you get how you challenge and, and, and go through those challenges by being organized and being strategic and, and doing all the right things to overcome challenges and downturns, you have to prepare for that. And a lot of companies don't do that. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I think like what, what I've seen in this space, people I've worked with, they're good with people. Well, so they do, there are some things that a lot of CEOs, I know they're good with people. They know how to yeah. motivate. Big one that we've been talking about is they hire well. That's but the true. challenge is, but the challenge is if we're talking about somebody who owns the business, the people that they've hired are likely going to leave at some point. And if you've got a great goal setter or somebody who's really focused on that, that's on your executive team and they leave, then suddenly you're like, oh, wait, I haven't been paying attention to that because Mark's been my guy. Mark decided to go found his own company or he's retiring or whatever it is. Now I need to go back and like do these things again. Yeah, I think a lot of times the way you can keep good people is to provide what I call golden handcuffs. You give yep. them incentives that they're not going to want to leave. You provide yep. all the, the things that makes it very difficult. You, you know, a lot of owners don't like to give up equity. I, I like uh, if someone's making me, uh, our my company is really successful, and I own a large part of it, and we go from one million to a hundred million. I don't. I'm not. Uh, I don't mind giving part of my equity away to be, to help them. No. They have to no. earn it over time. So you can create what I call golden handcuffs to allow yeah. these people uh, to allow them to succeed and continue to grow within the organization, to develop it and to make money based on the success of the organization. So I think there's a lot of ways that companies don't use to keep good employees around or they forget about it. Yeah. Mark, what's the thing that you're most proud of? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I think the impact that I've had on people when they come up and they say thank you for what you've done and what you've done to help them out. I've been blessed, I guess, because God has given me the ability to be educated and to learn. I'm proud of my successes and what the impact I've had on a lot of people, even when I was younger. The best thing that anybody can ever do for me is just to say, hey, thank you. You've really helped me out. I've learned the attitude of gratitude and being positive and helping other people and thanking them for for that and doing what I can to set an example of what other people might do to help achieve their success. So, uh, you know, I, I don't really like to talk about me and, and much and what I'm proud of. I'm, I'm just, look, 100 years from now, nobody's going to know who I am, right? Unless I'm the president of the United States, I'm not going to... But just having impact, I think God put me on this earth to be able to serve other people. And by serving other people, I get the benefit out of it. Hold on a second, Mark. Is this your official announcement that you are you're throwing your name in the hat for the election next year? Is that, is that what's happening right now? Whoa, that's a first for the show. Don't do it. Don't do it. I'm not doing it. I'm, I'm you're I'm like, not, not to do it. You know, yeah. my wife. Uh, I said, you know, I would love to run for political office. I'd only run for one term, but I yeah. tell everybody that I this is what I'm going to do. You can donate to my campaign. I'm not making any promises, but I'm going to yeah. do all the right things for the benefit of most people. I can't please everybody. And yeah. I, so I said, well, look, if you wanted to run for office, then uh, then we're probably not going to want to get married. I said, no, 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 no. You yeah. know, because that's a that's a kiss of death, really. I think. Yeah. Uh, all the smart people and the good people who want to make an impact. Yeah, for sure. Right for office and they could get things done, they would do it. But you can't get anything done because it's too political and too too polarized. You can't, you know, so yeah. I would never do it. I'd love to because I think I can yeah. make an impact, but it's just not worth it. You'd probably change your tune on, hey, Mark, how are you doing today? It probably wouldn't be terrific. You'd be like, oh. <laughs> oh, no, I'd be very positive. Oh. But it doesn't Look, when people ask me, how can you be so terrific every day? And I go, well, just some days are more terrific than others. Right. Yeah. So that's yeah. the attitude. So yeah. it's not, not every day is terrific. Every day is terrific, but it's just less terrific some days versus others. Yeah. Mark, how? what's something that you're afraid might be true about you? 
Oh man. This is this is the therapy question. We're gonna we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna give you a box Maybe of Kleenex and lay down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I, that's a very difficult question to answer. First of all, I probably don't understand a question well enough to understand it. Well, maybe you can you can add it to your 90 questions and you get somebody really in the hot seat when you're interviewing. So oh. let me you want you want me to give you a little context for this one? No, hold on. I think I wrote something down on this, but I want to okay, share. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah. well, I think you know, when it comes to being passionate about what I'm capable of, what I'm that they might people think uh, then I might be arrogant, which I'm not. I don't want to give that impression. That would probably would be I'm most afraid of that what I'm doing is because I'm so passionate about it that it might come across as being arrogant or all you think about is money or something like that. And and that is a result of people being negative and you can't really, I can't really change that. So I guess yeah. that would be my biggest fear. Mm. So the second part of this question, which I don't give my guests because I like to chat about it, but you've answered it for us a few times, I think, is what do you do to compensate for that fear? And I think you've mentioned it a few times. You don't really like to talk about yourself so you don't prove that you're arrogant. Yeah. You know, I have to catch myself sometimes because I'm always wanting to people to maybe recognize the fact that I've done something for them. And if they don't say thank you, thank you, it kind of bothers me. Right. Yeah. And so maybe mm-hmm. I, I'm probably one that needs to be a front. I've told my wife this. I need, probably need to be a, um, a lot more than I have, which is is difficult because, you know, you want to have an impact. You want people to say, hey, you've had an impact. And when they don't, you think, well, maybe I didn't. So I'm yeah. probably a guy that needs to have more affirmations mm-hmm. in my life. And I never really I never really got it from my my dad and my parents, they, yep, they always yep. all my events and did everything, but they never showed a kind of affirmation of love and kindness that I think uh, that I missed when I was growing up. So I'm, I'm probably the, I'm probably most afraid of that. That's a good, that's a good leadership lesson. I was talking to a client earlier this week and they, they're they pretty high level and they're having some significant challenges with their boss around just the style they, they've got, they went through a reorg, they have a new boss. And I asked him and I said, if you could get one thing from your boss, what would it be? He said, I just want to be told I'm doing a good job every now and again. He never, it's a he, I think men are much, I, I, this is stereotypical, but I think men have more of a challenge with this than, than women generally in business generally. As he said, it's amazing. Like I know I'm doing a good job. Everybody knows I'm doing a good job. You'd have to pay my boss a million dollars to just say, Hey, Hey, Mark, you're doing a great job. He's like, I never heard it from him. And we've worked on and off together for years. So that's an interesting leadership thing to ask people what they need. You know, it's funny because I make sure that I do that a lot. Even when I consult, yeah. I'll pull somebody aside, you know, Melissa, so much you know you're doing a really good job. Things are tough around here. You've been passionate about it. I really appreciate what you're doing for this company. I know John yeah. appreciates it. Yeah, that's better than it's giving a them a huge difference. Up. Yeah. Makes a, yeah, it makes a huge difference for people. Exactly. And I'll, I think leaders don't do a lot of that. And I know I, I, I make it a point. Gratitude, yeah. the attitude of gratitude is so big. And maybe I don't, I hate to say that, but I probably don't get enough of it because I want it just as much as I give it out, right? Of course. Yeah. It's good. Well, it's good to know that about yourself because when you know what you want, you can actually ask for it. Yeah, but you got to be tempered too, you know? I, yeah. That's oh, hard. Yeah. You know, you gotta be, that's the hard part of being tempered. Yeah. So Mark, how do you see the world? I see the world as a big challenge, challenge of being what I would say, ego driven, having a what's in it for me attitude, a challenge based on monetary challenges. And, and so that's, again, that's what I'm trying to do is get people to be aware of these challenges and how detrimental it could have on society over time. Cause I think we're going down this path. Cause when you look at, you know, we look at TV, um, it's the shows are on TV when I was growing up, like Captain Kangaroo or Father's Knows Best and Brady Bunch and all those great shows that actually taught something. Now the shows you see are naked and afraid or here come the Kardashian and they're all teaching really crude stuff. And it's supposed to be funny. That's just not the way it is. And yeah. so, you know, my goal really, and this may sound like unrealistic, but it, it's a dream, is to try to help change the world 
about why self-centeredness is dri driving us down a destructive path. And it's mm. killing America, in my opinion. So that's the reason I wrote the book, because I thought the book could be helpful in changing people's attitudes. That's why my wife and I are trying to uh, put together this series of books to help kids learn at a very early age about morals, respect, and character, and please, and thank you, and excuse me, and all those things I don't think they're getting at school. So we want to make a change. They say people who are crazy enough to change the world are usually the ones who do. Well, maybe I can be one of those people. I just hope oh, I Beautiful. Listen. Beautiful, Mark. Well, we're going to, I'm going to put a link to your book, a link to the the pledge you put in. How else can people connect with you and find out more about the work you do and all the great but, things you're doing? Yeah, and I also, Mark, because you're here, I'd love if you would share with us, this is really inspiring to me, what you and your wife are up to and have coming out soon too. That's very cool. Okay. Uh, first, I'll go through that. My wife and I are, are generating a series of books. It's all centered, centered around a cuttlefish. A cuttlefish is a I like the squid family and a cuttlefish has eight arms and two tentacles. And so my wife's a, a teacher and she's written children's books. And we're, we're putting together a series of children's book around specific world words, kindness, respect, doing the right thing, uh, accountability. You're, you're still, you're okay as who you are, et cetera, et cetera. And, and she's, it's a rhyming book and it's coming out. And the whole idea is to center these books around kids from kindergarten to fourth grade to learn these qualities because these qualities can have an impact on not only their life, but the lives of other people. So that's that's kind of what the, the series is called Camilla mm -hmm. Cuttlefish Makes a Splash. And Love so, it. Yeah, that's what we're working on. We'll have the first book out probably the first part of, of this coming year, next year. And if people want to get a hold of me, they can go to marklewisllc.com. M-A-R-K-L-E-W-I-S-L-L-C.com. It can learn all about my interview technique. It can learn about the initiatives I'm doing with the new startup. It can learn about my consulting. It's all there in one package. Awesome. Well, I was telling Mark before we pressed record, you got a you have a new customer for the children's books too, because we we have a we have two kids. One of them is right in that sweet spot who she loves to read, she loves animals. And we're teach, trying to teach her all these good values. So really cool. Really cool that you're doing that together. Uh, you're doing all the right things, not only, in, and I appreciate you having me on this show and hopefully you get the message. You look, if I can, we, you and I can make an impact of one or two people, you know, I've done a job, you know, we continue, but we got to get to one to two to 10 to a hundred to a million to a hundred million. That's the impact. And then you're doing a terrific job by Thanks. I appreciate you having me on there and getting that message out of how important it is. Yeah, Mark, it's funny you say this to wrap up for today. A lot of times as a, and this, you know, you probably look, this show has been on, I'm wrapping up the fourth season. So that's, you know, I've got a lot, almost 200 episodes now. People go, why do you do it? What are your numbers like? I said, and they go, oh, do you care about the numbers? I said, not really. I said, if I have Mark on and one person's listens to that episode and it changes something about them for the better, I consider that time well spent. That's how I look at it. And, you know, when you talk, they're like, oh, I need this huge impact. Yeah, that's great. But imagine there's somebody here who's like, hey, something that Mark said really struck me. I need to go and thank my leadership team more. That's a huge win. Absolutely. You know, it's funny. When I wrote the book, I had a friend of mine buy the book, and he bought a book for his, for his mom. And they, they both went off separately and read the book. And then they both got together, and he's actually a testimonial in my book. He got together with his mom and said, you know, we, we talked about your book. And we talked about it at length. And you know what happened? It drew my mom and I closer than we've ever been before. Amazing. And very, very satisfying to hear, for me to hear that I had an impact on two lives. Not only yeah. just one, but I brought two people together. And, and it was just so satisfactory to me. And that's, you know, that's yeah. what we're trying to do. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's an example. That's priceless, right? You talk about business and revenue, but you talk about yeah. somebody getting closer to their parent. And I don't know the age, but, you know, like that's priceless. It was very satisfying. And when I hear those kind of stories, as much time and effort that we that you and I put into what we're trying to do, if it makes an impact on people's lives and betters their lives, that's that's all worth it. You're right. I was going to ask you to leave us with some words of wisdom, but I think you just did that. <laughs> yeah, the words of wisdom is this. And I had to quote, I said, individually, you can make a difference. Collectively, we can change the world. 
And that's the message that the give a damn philosophy is all about. Awesome. Mark, thank you so much for being on today. Happy Friday. Glad we can make this happen bright and early here in the East Coast. Wonderful to have you on. We'll have you back on here maybe next season, see what you're up to. Maybe talk about some of the things you're doing in the startup world. You let me know a little bit about the idea. Sounds really good. Best uh, best wishes to you and the family. Happy holidays. Enjoy. Yeah, thank you, Jason. You've been terrific. I, I really have enjoyed our conversation. You're making a big impact on this world, and um, I can't thank you enough for that impact you were making. So thank you. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to another episode of Talking to Cool People with Jason Frizzell. If you enjoyed today's episode, please tell your friends. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook and give us a shout out or take a moment to leave a review on iTunes. If something from today's episode piqued your interest and you'd like to connect, email us at podcast at jasonfrizzell.com. We love hearing from our listeners because you're cool people too.